The only people who don't want to disclose the truth are people with something to hide. Why is it clear answers for common questions? Email evidence is any type of information that is contained within or attached to an electronic mail transmission and is considered admissible as evidence in a court of law. Hello, YouTube. Well, you heard that. Admissible in a court of law. Now, I'm just showing y'all this. Y'all can listen to the rest of it and pay attention to it. But there's a lot of stuff going on here. Just don't like it. At present, many countries have come to accept email transmissions as constituting reliable evidence that can be presented in both civil and criminal cases. So many countries have done this, and they all agree to the same rule. Now, explain to me, people, how Vizio and Twitter can change their tweets and their videos. Hmm, sounds funny to me. Constituting reliable evidence that can be presented in both civil and criminal cases. The use of this type of evidence is limited in some jurisdictions around the world, and even prohibited in others. Just about any portion of the email transmission may be used as email evidence. The date and time stamps at both the point of origin and the point of destination of the email may help to establish when the correspondence took place. Wow! Did you hear that? What a awesome, what a awesome type thing to say. My goodness. I mean, everything I told y'all was straight up. Ain't that just so kind of strange? All text included in the body of the email itself could possibly contain information that is relevant to a civil or criminal trial, including any dates events, or people who are mentioned within that text. Even attachments to email transmissions that include text, charts, financial data, slide presentations, or any type of images may also be introduced as evidence, assuming they are relevant to the matter under consideration. Well, let's see, folks. Now, you've heard all the testimony so far, and you've, you're reading this text as we go. I know it's slipping back to this Facebook thing, but that's okay. You're going to get to hear about that in a minute, too. So, explain to me, folks. I mean, uh, you big bust nut busters out there that bu tried to bust somebody's nut, explain this one, okay? When going through the process of email discovery, it is often necessary to confirm that the email evidence is secure. There must be no sign that any portion of the email was tampered with in an attempt to mislead law officials or court officers. For example, before a printed copy of an email would be allowed as evidence in any type of legal proceedings, there is a good chance that the court of jurisdiction would require that the email copy be certified. Wow, it's got to be certified too. Man, I just don't get it. I mean, they can literally change a text and a tweet and a video and... They're getting away with it legally? With all of this information? Shut up! Will you please? Authorized and trained personnel would have to confirm or deny that what is presented on the hard copy is an exact copy of the email transmission that was sent and received. In order to manage this process of affirming the veracity of the email evidence, it is not unusual for law enforcement to seize devices where the emails are stored. Damn. Did you hear that? <laughs> I just don't get it. I, I just don't I just don't understand. Damn. I, I just don't understand. I win. You lose. Ha ha. Get her done one more time. Ha ha. This allows the officers to research the contents of any email files including in boxes and sent mail in various types of email programs. In some cases, the email service providers may also play a role in affirming the content of an email, thus making it somewhat difficult to successfully tamper with the information included in any given transmission. While email evidence, 
as well as other forms of computer evidence, were once considered somewhat suspect. Modern methods that make it easier to confirm the nature of the documents has led to many courts readily accepting emails and email attachments as admissible evidence. In some instances, this type of evidence has made it possible to solve criminal cases in much less time and allow the judicial system to handle cases in a more efficient manner. As the number of people who rely on electronic communications to conduct commercial and private business continues to increase, more court systems are likely to develop and implement programs that make it possible to assess email evidence for inclusion in court cases. Okay guys, this right here is a little clip right here that I'm not going to interrupt. I want you to hear it and uh, it's going to be read to you and afterwards I'm going to show you some more stuff and show you why all of this is happening and why they're doing what they're doing or at least I'm going to try. So much love to y'all and here goes the rest. Facebook status update provides alibi New York CNN for 19-year-old Rodney Bradford. A simple Facebook status update turned into much more, a rock-solid alibi after he was accused of a crime. Confirmation of the timestamp on the update and the location from which it was entered showed he could not have been at the scene of a robbery in another part of New York City. After he had spent almost two weeks in jail, the case against him was dismissed. The story began at 11.49 a.m. on Saturday, October 17th, when Bradford was updating his Facebook status at his father's home in Harlem. A minute later, 12 miles away in Brooklyn, two men were mugged at gunpoint. The next day, Bradford, who was facing a separate 2008 robbery indictment, found out police were looking for him in connection with the Brooklyn robbery. Bradford turned himself in, confident he would be cleared. But after one of the victims picked him out of a lineup, he was charged with robbery in the first degree and sent to Rikers Island, home of the New York City jail. It wasn't until Rodney Bradford Sr. discovered his son's Facebook update that the young man's defense attorney realized he had an unbeatable alibi. Throughout the week, said the attorney, Robert Royland, I worked with the district attorney's office and made them aware of who our alibis were presented the Facebook evidence and generally tried to convince them that it would be wrong to proceed to an indictment in light of this evidence. The district attorney subpoenaed Facebook for documentation that would prove Bradford had updated his account from his father's home in Harlem. It worked. It all corroborated our alibis, explained Royland. The Facebook thing was really the icing on the cake. I think, ultimately, it's what prompted the dot to dismiss. The district attorney's office would not comment on the story because the case is sealed. Facebook officials said they are pleased they were able to serve as a constructive part of the judicial process. The online social network is ready to join telephone records and video cameras as a means of establishing an alibi but the implications are both good and bad, says an intellectual property attorney versed in the medium. We're in a much more trackable world, and for better and for worse said attorney Jonathan Handel. The extent to, which it means that the right people get prosecuted, and the innocent get their cases dropped, that's all of the good. But, he said, the issue of privacy is also at stake. And he pointed out that it could be argued that Facebook update was a setup. On the internet, nobody really knows it's you, he said. A kid could set up an alibi by setting up a Facebook update. Royland finds that unlikely. This is a 19-year-old kid. He's not a criminal genius setting up an elaborate alibi for himself, he said. This is not the kind of thing someone would fake. And if someone were going to fake it, he said, they do it in a lot clearer way than the inside joke that Bradford posted on the phone with his fat chick. Where my IHOP? The message was met with some incomprehension by reporters first writing about the story who didn't quite understand the reference to the International House of Pancakes. Royland explained it this way, the fat chick was a playful reference to Bradford's pregnant girlfriend, who was irked that he, his father and his stepmother had gone to an IHOP without her the night before. The update teased that she wondered where her pancakes were. He was just kind of taunting her playfully about having been to IHOP, Royland said. 
I know it sounds not very nice but it's sort of a reference to her because she's pregnant. But they actually have a very good relationship. She's cute as a button. Now that his innocence has been demonstrated, Bradford has hired civil attorney Herbert L. Schmel, who say they are 99.9% .9 sure that they will be filing a civil suit against the city. Based upon what I see, there was no probable cause to arrest him at the time, Schmel said. And to put him in Rikers for 12 or 13 days. We are seeking money damages. Hello YouTube. Well this is, uh, in my opinion, kind of a disturbing story. Um, someone spoke out, said some things, upset, and you're going to read the article. I'm going to let the article read. You read the article yourself. I'm going to let you come over here to the blog and read it. And you can watch the four videos, or I think there's five videos on here. This one's part one. This is what started it. And this is part two where he finished up on it. And then he come out with uh, part three, which is coming up now. And I'm going to stop it right there for a second. And what y'all got to understand by me making this video um, and putting it along with the one that goes along with the uh, proof of using timestamps and uh, cash and all that stuff uh, on the internet is because basically that's what they done to him in a roundabout way. Is it not? I mean, he's not backing away from it or changing it or saying anything. He actually said it. Uh, but the point of it is, is I'm putting it all together because all this goes together. Because mainly that's why we're doing what we're doing to start with. Because Biden right here in this video which some of you have done seen where he comes out and says that Obama's going to sign an executive order to uh, amend the second amendment and if you really want to know the truth the first time I watched that if I'd have made a video I'd have probably said it's pretty close to the same thing he said because I'd have been mad and upset in fact that's the reason why I didn't make no video at that particular time because I was mad and very upset but sometimes we make mistakes not necessarily meaning they're bad but anyway so I made a blog on it I put it all together and I'm showing you why he was upset which is this so I maybe I should have put this at the top so but I didn't uh, I put it at the bottom because I wanted everybody to understand it. And I put monograph because he done a good job of explaining it himself. And then the text is in here too. You can read it and you can click on the links and go uh, to see other things as well. And then you can see the video that created the controversy. And then you can see where he tried to fix it on part two. And that escalated it even more. And then this one here, he is talking with a friend of his that's an attorney. So, much like this video too long already. But everything that I've been telling y'all about tweeting and texting, and, uh, all this stuff can be used against you in the court of law. How is it legal for you to change it? I'm not saying that it did they get changed and it it can't be done. I'm not saying that. I don't don't miss don't take the words out of my mouth here and misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm saying it can be done. I know it can be done, but legally it's not legal. You get my drift here? It's not legal. So whoever's doing it, like Twitter and uh, Vizio. They need to fix their problem very quickly or there's going to be a lot of people getting out of jail because of this. Now have much love. Y'all have a good night.
If there's a blue pill and a red pill, and the blue pill is half the price of the red pill and works just as well, why not pay half price?